Hi, I'm Jim Leonard. I'm also known uh, in the scene as Trickster, and I am a longtime uh, demo scene person. I've attended many competitions and won a few of them, uh, and I also archive uh, vintage computers software and vintage computer history. My name is Rowan Litkovitz. Online, I have been better known as Cthulhu of Mr. Green and Acid. Hi, my name is Vega Shevstad. Um, I'm also known as Shady of the uh, demo scene group called the Crusaders of the Amiga scene. Um, I don't know a lot. I grew up in computers. I've been a nerd. I've been a um, hacker. I've been recording for this and that, but I'm probably mostly known for starting the gathering in uh, Norway. Hi, I'm Bill Hart, and uh, I'm a mathematician in the real world, and uh, really interested in retro hardware. So I have a YouTube channel, uh, PC Retro Tech, uh, where I look at old hardware and then try to program it uh, using some of the old style demo scene techniques. Although not technically part of a BBS, the demo scene grew up alongside BBSs. The demo scene has been around since the late 1980s and still exists to this day. Demos are computer programs that show off the capabilities of the computer and also the programmer. The demo scene is a cyber culture that exists around these demos. Thousands of people across the world compete in what are known as parties. Sometimes the demos are made by individuals, however most are made by small teams of ace elite programmers. For example, one may do the artwork, one may do the programming, and another the music. Many of the demos that have been made really show off what is possible on that computer. I recall running a PC in the early to mid 90s and watching demos called Second Reality and Panic by a group called Future Crew. What I saw was software that pushed the computer to its absolute limits. It was awe-inspiring for a young teenager to see that graphics and sound could be put on the screen of a computer in ways that the computer programming courses and instruction books would have you believe were not possible. For example, it was common knowledge that the original CGA color graphics adapter on the PC was only capable of four colors on the screen at any one time and had no notion of sprites. And those colors were decidedly garish. You'll find out during these interviews that recent demos have shown that it's possible to do about a thousand colors and display sprites on even equipment made in 1981. The demo scene didn't start with the PC. It had its roots on the Amiga, the Atari ST, as well as the Commodore 64. Even platforms as esoteric as the BBC Micro and the ZX Spectrum were included in the demo scene at some point or another. The demo scene is alive and well in the second decade of the 21st century, and despite COVID-19, members of demo scene crews across the world held remote parties to cover submissions of the demo crews. These parties include Assembly, which is an international event hosted in Finland since 1992. The venues for these events top over 5,000 visitors in sports arenas. There's also Chaos Constructions in Russia, The Gathering in Norway, and Revision in Germany, to name but a few of the other bigger parties. Also worthy of mention, a number of enthusiasts get together virtually and in person annually for Flash Party, which is based in Argentina. It's a tour de force of BBS, ANSI, music, and demo scene enthusiasts that very much carries the flame of the original parties. Like ANSI art teams, BBSs were popping up all over the place specifically for the demo scene. Some were official BBSs of a particular demo crew, and some were distributors of zip files that contained demos. The demo scene was so intertwined with BBSs, the two are still seen as close allies with demos still being launched or distributed on BBSs today. The amazing thing about my experience in the underground cybercrime community is that uh, very quickly we determined that even though we got on board in order to obtain uh, unpaid access to commercial software by by making art 
a really weird kind of economic transaction when you stop to think about it. Um, teenage boys making art in order to trade each other for stolen software. The the wares, the the pirated goodies, they weren't as interesting. The the art was interesting, even though criminal computer underground activities were very much a motivating factor uh, getting the scene kicked off. Very quickly, it was backgrounded. You know, cracking games is fun. Making crack throws is fun. Uh, but what's more fun than playing a stolen game? Seeing your crack throw on a giant screen at an arena with a thousand nerds screaming your crew's name because you have shown them something they didn't know was possible to do on a Commodore 64. That's, that's cool. That's the, that's the real thrill. I was lucky. It's like, uh, I'm born in 1970, which is like pre any home computer stuff. Uh, but uh, I never grew up having like a console, you know, like the early first gens, stuff like that. Uh, but my dad worked in computers. I had like a proper computer uh, at home. And we were also able to use them to communicate. But that worked with airport systems. You know, when that tells us, okay, this plane is delayed, it's coming in this and that. So we already, he already worked with modern technology. So I, you know, it was kind of just technically, technically interesting. Uh, and then I discovered that I could connect to different places. At first, there wasn't really any BBSs to connect to at all in Norway at that time. Uh, so my first stop was actually to connect to the universities both in Norway, but also I discovered I could call like the University of, of Leeds and play MUD. Then I would have to talk to people, they would have the different stuff. Uh, but then, of course, it grew a scene and uh, other people came in and uh, I would do it because it would be into, call it the demo scene. And, and uh, um, we grew several BBSs and then I discovered that I had a knack of helping people doing it. So I actually helped setting up a lot more BBSs than what I did during that time. So of course I was on the BBSs first and then I discovered I could tell people. Uh, and then it just grew an environment around it. And you get to know people and uh, somebody would do wares, somebody would do different uh, stuff. And then of course you would start to have the fight on that and other networks so you could talk to people around the globe and get in touch with people and um, back then if you you know you had a computer and a modem and uh, you could talk to anybody else who did it i mean literally you could talk to anybody else that did it because they would be interested just because you had the same setup you know it felt like you know if you wanted to talk to well you know one of my friends went into music so he just sent a message to prince because it was kind of cool and prince was online and he answered back and you know he wouldn't you probably got like 10,000 letters a day, but only one email because nobody else had it. So it, it, it was just uh, the feeling of it and you know, just being part of that crowd and discovering new things. What is the demo scene? Demo scene. Uh, so the demo scene today uh, doesn't really match what its origins are. The demo scene started out actually as the software pirating scene, the, the cracking scene. Uh, everyone who's uh, played some old games, uh, think 1980s games, uh, usually if they copied them illicitly, there was some sort of a scrolling message or a, a static title screen or something that introduced who cracked it and who spread it. And uh, those crack screens, originally where they were static and then they had a small moving message, which was like a shout out to all their friends. Uh, and then occasionally, and then they'd started bringing in music. And then, so around 1987 or so, uh, especially on the Commodore 64, I remember, um, you would get these fairly elaborate introductions uh, before the game actually ran. And uh, in the demo scene, we colloquially call those crack tros. But uh, so you would make a you know copy of a tape or you make a copy of a diskette, and then it became a race, right? They would introduce copy protection schemes from the companies because they didn't want to give away the work for free. I thought they get that part. And then some people would call it, you know, crack the games, like do the introduction. Uh, and of course, then you would have that, well, I cracked this, I did that. You would leave like a little text note or uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes you would have interactions with the people behind the copy schemes. 
uh, there was, uh, oh, can't remember the name, but on oh, no, so the spe Spectrum, uh, which was like a specific loader. And uh, the people who made that uh, copy prediction scheme left a lot of trash talk to the people. So of course, it trash talked back, right? But it would be text. And then somebody on the Commodore 64 said, well, we need to do better. So they made a little crack troll, which is like a super tiny introduction. So instead of just having text going <laughs> or on screen, they would have it like screen running around and scrolling and have a little music and a little color in it, making it interesting. And every pirating group had both uh, a cracking scene and like a like a an intro or a crack tro uh, group like portion of the group as well. And over time, the people who made the demo parts just splintered off. Um, from those crack trolls, I think the thousand one crew is credited with having the first one that was the, like from the demo scene. Uh, that would, of course, attract other people, and it developed into the fact that, okay, we don't need a game cracked to actually release something to show off our skill. And then you would, be, you would do graphics, you would do music, you would do code to show off different effects, like you would open the borders on Commodore 64 to use the, or, or show what I can do, and uh, nobody thought it was possible. Look at how uh, many stars I can put on the screen. Look at the star field I can do. Look at how great this looks like. This looks like Star Trek. And I'm not a TV channel, but look what I can do. You know, and it's just uh, showing how big brass and balls you had and how cool you were doing the things you could do. And that's where the demo scene comes from. So it's a really um, <clears throat> showed off the, the best parts of what you could actually do with the, the hardware, the limitations of the hardware at the time to, to make these demos, right? Yeah, it's like it's like a jamming of a band and uh, it's just like you're know, showing it off and you would show other people. And uh, uh, from there, you would uh, you would say you had the demo scene, uh, you would spread and you know how skilled your intro looked like or just your demo. It would impress other people and other people wanted to learn from you. So they would get in touch with you. And then, of course, you would have physical meets. Like, this is like mm, right around 85, 86, 87. Um, and I look at it now, it's like I was 15, 16. I got to travel into Europe. I went to Germany for like the Sebit demo stuff and shit like that at the time, you know, sleeping on somebody's couch. It's like, hell, I have a son who's 16. He's not allowed to go, that, uh, go there, you know, but that's what he did back then. And you met people online, so I knew them. So I could just, hey, I'm coming to town. Can I, you know, borrow a couch? No problem, right? This is like a couch surfer's paradise at the time because you knew each other. And then it would meet up, you would have these uh, physical uh, setups, you would code together, you would learn from each other. Um, you would start out knowing each other, sort of. Uh, and then you would go to parties where there were new people that you didn't know. And you would just pass them by, it's like, hey, look at that screen. How did it do that? And you're like having an instant connection because everybody wants to show off how cool they are. And um, it's not to brag in, in that sense that it, uh, I wanted to show you because you understood. Because if I showed it to my mom or my dad or my classmates or, you know, somebody in school, they wouldn't get it like that. If you show a really cool, you know, 64 in, intro to anybody today, they don't understand because they don't understand what the 64K limitation means for what you can actually physically do. So it's hard because they will compare it to what somebody else can do with, you know, 200 people working on a super you know, computer farm. <laughs> and it, it's not a competition. So you need to have, understand the limitations to do so. And uh, limitations in my mind builds creativity a lot, right? The limitations made you think in certain directions. And that's what uh, happens with the coding, that happens with the graphics. Uh, today, everything is built into DirectX, or you can use uh, Unity or Uno or whatever setup you want to create stuff. Back then, you had to invent all the algorithms, whether it being 2D, the Starfield, a 3D setup, and it would be coded for your hardware. Right. 
So then, and I think you just um, you just briefly mentioned the the genesis of it there, but it wasn't just one uh, group of people doing it on their own in their bedrooms and then you know sending this out on a floppy disk. People, uh, this this scene came up. What what exactly is the demo scene? What what happened? Well, it's um, her associated with it. You would band together, you'd find a group of friends, uh, you would try to emulate your heroes, you try to do different things. Um, we were a group of friends who met sort of like loosely around um, the basement of a local mall uh, called Lillestrøm City. We had something in your store called Space World, which was like super cool at the time. And you would just meet up with the people who are equally geeky as yourself, and then they would hang out and say, like, yeah, come along to my house, we'll do this and that. And, you know, you do whatever else a group of friends do, you know, watch movies, eat pizza, uh, go out for a bear, you know, everything like that. But you would also share your stuff, and then it would be creative together. Uh, when you would go to uh, copy parties, for example, um, there would be competitions, early, early demo scene competitions for who had the best crack trow. And I would say around 1990, uh, 1991, those kind of split off to be just about the demo scene. And of course, there were there was certainly a lot of copying that happened at demo parties as well. But it was that's I would say around 1991 is when it was definitely splintering off into its, its own scene. So uh, yeah, the uh, the demo scene is essentially created by uh, teenagers trying to impress their friends uh, through code, graphics, and music. Um, the Crusaders made music discs, which was like a you know an album on a diskette. <laughs> uh, we would do the demo stuff. We like, you would have a complete demo on one diskette and you would spread it. You would spread it through the BBSs. You would do it through physical mediums. Uh, so it cre creates this sub community. And I mean, it's no different. It happened like with, you know, uh, in, in, in any setup, like when YouTube was new, it happened in, uh, with the YouTubers. All right. So then, so there's all these people, they banded together and then they made parties. Right? Well, first off, to start off with it, it was more, more like a hangout. So it built with the groups. It started like, you know, like call it almost like a pizza party in somebody's basement. And then somebody figured out that, well, of course, you can invite people to come over for the weekend and let's borrow the local school hall and stuff like that. And uh, we went around to a lot of these parties. Um, um, uh, I started one of the biggest and the original one, the gathering in Norway. Uh, anyway, uh, you prepared things for uh, the competitions. And in this place, they took everybody else. You were not allowed to stay anywhere else in school. They had to take you over to the sports hall, the auditorium. And I would sit down and uh, we had complained a lot about them uh, not having a music competition. So we persuaded them. Of course, we had three very good musicians. So we wanted them to win, and if they didn't have a music competition, they wouldn't be able to win anything. So we did it. So they didn't really like us from the start. And then when they started doing it, we compla complained about everything. And they'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, music sucks. Uh, the video is wrong. Oh, you can't do that, you can't do this. And so one of the freaks uh, got up and was like, hey, you know reason, guys, shut the f up or do something better to yourself. Half a second later, yeah, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna kick your ass. You know, we're gonna have the biggest and best party ever in Norway. We'll let you know. <laughs> you know, can't say no to that challenge, right? Uh, and when we opened up the gathering, we did use our year chart, we did use the BBSs. You know, we called around the BBSs, I called like 50 BBSs, I had like a complete list, called about twice a week. Uh, putting out the invitations, talking to people, chatting, letting them know, oh, come to Norway, do this, oh, you drive this way, it's so easy, yes, beer is cheap in Norway, and, you know, so just getting people to wanting to come to the party. And when, uh, well, we thought we would be super cool, we would have the biggest party ever, and uh, then it would be 600 people, that's great. 1,100 people showed up. And our, our organizational skills probably capped at 250. <laughs> they wouldn't put me there sitting right straight on the floor. You would have these styrofoam mats they would lay on top of. And then we'd be on top of these power cables and they would melt during the night into the power cables. <laughs> but nobody died. <laughs> so it's a great success. What year was the biggest crowd that you had? 
Well, we've been sold out, you know, since about 1998 in the Viking ship. So it varies. So it's um, every year since about 2005, because I think it maxed out about 6,000 people. So, so um, and that's still going today? Still going today. Uh, I left the organization to do other stuff like five years ago. So now they're happy doing their own thing and stuff like that. So. And that's kind of cool. So uh, I said we, we didn't do other stuff. Uh, as I said, I was there uh, for also for the birth of DreamHack, which everybody knows more today. So it's like, it's always been this living thing and it's always been about the social part of it. And I'm not gonna say that, uh, you know, being all like super cool and saying, that's what we aim for at the start. No, we only aim for being the biggest assholes on the block. <laughs> Nothing else. That was our goal. Just being the coolest kids, right? But we never aim for it to be specifically targeted to one technology. As I said, the Purisms, the A500 only. We allowed everything and uh, went in early to allow you to develop things. Uh, we always wanted the people to have fun with the stuff they did. In most cases, did most people come along and um, develop their demos during the the gathering for the few days that it was going, or, or did they did they come part and part? And the thing is that it's like if you invite musicians to come in and jam, right? They are who they are when they arrive. They been you know they've been playing music and rehearsing for decades before they come in and do shit. Okay, they probably come in with some idea they want to develop there, but they put it together at the party. And they had to iron out the kinks at the part. So the demo seniors did the same thing. They would have some music and graphics. They would have to tie it together. They would work out the kinks and their effects and having, call it the flow between parts, if they had that, like the visual design and having it uh, snap together, so to speak. How old were you when you got into the demo scene and started writing demos? Well, my introduction to the demo scene was slightly later than other people my age. Um, I was born in 71. And so as a teenager, I would have been getting into the scene around 86 or 87, but it didn't quite exist for me then. Uh, how I discover it, uh, discovered it is that uh, I would download demo-like things and seek them out on BBSs, but I didn't really understand uh, that there was a whole scene you know, behind those things, or at least related things. Like I was interested in uh, little demo-ish programs, things that displayed a rotating hypercube in uh, 4D where you could uh, cross your eyes and try to see it in 3D, or little animated slideshows or something like that. And then finally that led me in late December, 1990 to download something called the Space Pigs Mega Demo. Uh, and that was, absolutely everything I had been looking for. It was not only uh, a lot of amazing code and specialized sound techniques. I had also been very interested in producing sound on a PC without any music hardware, without any specialized sound hardware. And it ticked all the boxes. It had real-time mixed four-voice music. It had real-time 3D, albeit simple, but it was still 3D. Uh, lots of uh, hardware tricks for scrolling and split screen at the same time. And most importantly for me, a message about this came from this BBS and then in the readme or rather the scrolling message, which I think I ended up uncompressing and, and um, dumping uh, all of the little executables that came with it to, to read all the text. Somewhere in all of that text was essentially a mention of a European demo scene. So in the beginning of 1991, uh, I went on a massive download frenzy, trying to find everything I could about demos in the demo scene. Uh, and by 1992, I was writing my own productions. And by uh, 95, I was entering competitions. So that's how it started for me. And did you get to go to Europe for any of those? Uh, how I wish I did. Unfortunately, no. Um, because let's see, around that time, I would have been in my very early 20s. Uh, I was also married and uh, had a child on the way. So disappearing to Europe to go gallivanting around uh, the countryside, writing demos and uh, drinking beer was probably not a good idea. However, um, we did have some competitions in North America 
Uh, the most famous of those were uh, called NAID, North American International Demo Competition. I think that's what it was called. And it was held uh, in a very European-like area of North America. It was held in Quebec, where uh, only half the population speaks English, or at least half the population pretends not to speak English. And they, um, uh, it was a, a couple of college kids who organized it at their local college campus. And so in 95 and 96, we had uh, a very large, uh, almost, almost um, uh, Easter party, breakpoint, revision-ish sized parties. We had um, about 800 people in 1995, and we had over 1,000 people in 96. And those were proper parties like the European style where you would actually spend your entire time on campus. You know, you'd sleep in sleeping bags and, you know, you'd never leave. And uh, so unfortunately, no, uh, the first proper European party that I finally went to was 25 years after entering the scene uh, when uh, myself and a group of friends entered um, 8088 miles per hour into revisions old school competition and we won. So I was very happy about that. Um, to be fair, if I'm gonna pony up the kind of money to go to a European uh, demo party, I'm bringing my A game. So if you see me at a European party, uh, you'd better watch out. <laughs> Talking about um, good code and bringing your A game, um, I, I want to know just how difficult it is for a seasoned programmer, right? So somebody who is a software engineer for a living and a good one at that. I, I have this expectation in my head that even if you're a good A grade software engineer, taking making demos, good demos, is another type of software engineering all on its own. And to me, it seems to be almost doing the impossible. What do you think? So, I mean, it, it completely depends on the platform that you're making demos for. And I'm gonna be the first to say upfront, I am not uh, an authority in any way on making demos for modern platforms. I mean, I know basically what's involved. Um, you know, obviously a lot of shader code. Uh, prob you probably do well to learn Vulkan API instead of trying to do it through DirectX. Um, the, it, so it depends. Uh, if you're a good programmer now, there's certainly nothing... Writing demos is a very specialized subset of that. It involves paying attention to things that you would not normally pay attention to. It's a lot like embedded systems programming or programming FPGAs, where you are very concerned with um, the path data takes through your application. Because while you can write programs that are very flexible, generally the more flexible a program is, the slower it is. You know, there's a tra classic trade-off between flexibility and speed. So writing a demo where you're trying to you know, utilize every cycle completely efficiently on any platform means thinking in that way, making sure that you understand, you know, if I use some sort of a system call, uh, is it going to copy data into a buffer and then copy it somewhere else? And, you know, if you're doing this many thousands or millions of times a second, you want to instead try to avoid as much double buffering and copying as possible. That's just one example. Um, another example is in the case of interfacing with the screen. If it's an old school platform, you need to know the, the technical details of how that system works. So you're going to be doing a lot of uh, reading if you, if you aren't immediately sure. If it's a modern demo, uh, then you'd better know your graphics pipeline. And it's as much research as, in fact, I mean, sometimes it can be more, but it's at least as much research as any uh, AAA game title uh, developer. 
So it can be intimidating, um, but that's the challenge. That's why people do it. That's why they like doing it. Uh, not all demos have to be uh, alternate thinking programming exercises. There are some demo systems. For example, there's Notch. Uh, some people do demos in Unity. Uh, Unity, of course, being the, uh, the game development uh, environment and scripting language. And you, for, you know, if you're not doing anything uh, technically complicated, you can certainly get away with those. Although Notch actually does let you get some technically complicated because, no surprise, Notch was written by demo coders uh, as well. But um, yeah, it's just you have to think less about programming the way you would for other people using your code and being flexible and more about tailoring your code and how it manages data to your target platform. So know your target platform is, I think, the main difference uh, in demo coding, because um, when you're writing modern code now, like let's say you're writing an app or something and it has to like work one way on the web and then it has to work another way on iOS and another way on Android. The last thing you're doing is trying to know what your platform is because you're trying to write platform agnostic code. Writing demos is very much writing platform specific code. So I'd say that that's probably the major difference and the thinking behind it. I guess classically and in, in most cases you're writing pretty much at the machine level. Yeah. For the most part, um, it doesn't always have to be at the machine level. If we're talking old school demos, then yes, it's absolutely <laughs> at the machine level. There's uh, there's no way around that. Great. Obviously, there was the scene as it was uh, that you knew from probably around 1991 all the way through to, well, I guess today. But the scene has changed as, you know, BBSs, uh, for example, went away and you know newer technology came in 3d acceleration you know apis microsoft windows you know all of these things that changed the way that software engineers write you know they like you say they write in a more abstracted way they don't tend to write at the machine level and in some cases they even write you know they they write more higher than c plus plus would do for example. sure Does heavily this, abstracted classes and so forth Right. So what does the scene now look like? I mean, not just in terms of um, the coding, the programming, look like obviously you've mentioned things like Unity, but what does the scene look like now as in people who attend it, what they do, is it as big as it once was? You know, what, what, what does the scene look like? Today? Well, I can give you my thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm one of the least qualified people to do so. The current state of the demo scene today uh, is actually kind of a lot like it was 30 years ago. It's, uh, it's mostly the same people. I would say over 50% of people who attend demo parties are actually uh, getting old and uh, they're kind of the same people, uh, at least the parties I've been to. It's, it's possible that others are full of people who are under the age of 30, but somehow I doubt that. Um, Demo parties then and now were excuses to get together with your friends. One of the most popular uh, pithy phrases of the demo scene is the real party is outside. And it's true. Uh, as much as there's coding and competitions and stuff going on inside, uh, there are bonfires and lots and lots and lots of drinking outside. And both are equally valid. And modern demo, modern parties have that, just as you know, uh, copy parties thirty years ago had. Um, I would say the majority of people who attend again are a little older, and um, I would say the majority of them are in a computer-related field, which should be probably no surprise. Doesn't necessarily have to be programming. Some of them are network engineers. Some of them are system administrators, like myself. Um, as some of them are pure musicians and have stayed that way. And actually some of them have nothing to do whatsoever with any of those professions. Um, one of the best musicians I know uh, is a videographer. He's a camera operator, um, and which has nothing to do with programming or graphics or uh, composing music. And he's an amazing, an amazing pro tracker composer. So, uh, you get all walks of life. Um, the only thing that I think that's been significantly different now is that um, 
technology aids in running the parties, uh, certainly websites to advertise them uh, back then, bringing this around to BBSs. <clears throat> uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, copy parties and demo parties were advertised uh, generally through word of mouth, sometimes through mail swapping, which I can get to in a bit, and uh, BBSs. And it was common to not only shout out to your friends in a crack trow and also and, and very definitely drop BBS numbers uh, on a crack trow, uh, sometimes they would also list upcoming parties. So back then, uh, BBSs were the main way to learn about a party and, uh, and possibly help organize it. Nowadays, that's completely replaced uh, by the internet, of course. For me, using a BBS back then was very much uh, a utility effort. A lot of, I mean, before the internet, when you wanted to talk to your friends, you kind of knew who your friends were. You saw them in person or you called them on the phone. Um, when we did talk with lots of people on a BBS, the BBS is located in a very centralized geographical location. Uh, you weren't having people far and wide contact the machine the BBS was running on because long, back then long distance cost a lot of money. One major difference between demos, the demo scene in, in the BBS days and the demo scene today is that very rarely today do you see a production released outside of a party. Uh, going to a demo party, having something compete, being up on the big screen, uh, having an audience that claps and, and jeers and uh, applauds and sometimes outright yells obscenities at the screen while your production is being shown. That's great motivation to get a demo scene production done, regardless of the platform, regardless of your skill level. Um, that's great, but I do miss the old days. Uh, there was one thing that is different about the old days of demo scening in the BBS era, and that is people made demos with no intention of going to a party. They made demos for fun and released them whenever they were done to their local BBS. Uh, there were, I mean, I would say up until 1993, well more than half, this is an estimate, um, of demos released between 87 and 93 uh, had nothing to do with any party or competition. They were just, it was just, here's our next release. And you don't see that these days. You don't, if a demo isn't released at some party in a competition, it generally gets zero eyeballs. And, and I, miss, I miss the old days. I miss uh, seeing new demos pop up just at random, you know, just because somebody had finished something. Um, so anyway, me memory from the BBS days. So I would like to know about your contributions to the demo scene. I mean, until I won... Until my group won the old school competition at Revision, I would I still have always considered myself small fry. Being a longtime aficionado of the demo scene uh, doesn't necessarily mean being a, a very prolific uh, quality contributor to it, but I certainly tried. I started in 92 with some local BBS intros of which I think I may only have one archived and it's quite terrible. So uh, no one will ever see that. Um, I produced the, uh, some of the results productions for um, Music Contest 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, I think, as well. Um, and that's actually how I was contacted to, to participate in the Hornet Demo Group, because um, somehow something I did, oh, I think it was the Grind Mod Player. So in 93, myself and a friend created uh, the Grind Mod Player, which... Um, borrowed heavily from uh, Otto Kranz's uh, DSMI library for playing mods, although I did rewrite some of the loaders because uh, some of them had some inaccuracies. The claim to fame of the grind mod player was that uh, if you had a, a four to the floor beat 64 row pattern mod that you were playing, it would uh, produce full uh, screen dancing girls that danced in perfect time to the mod being played. So of course you play all your techno and your dance and your club mods on it and stuff like that. Um, that got the attention of Snowman over at Hornet and he asked if I would like to work with him to code up these result productions. And I did, and I was sort of a budding archivist at the time. And so I offered to curate the code directory on the Hornet FTP site. And that's 
that was how I got started. In 95, I actually I didn't produce anything for 95. I was a judge at NAID 95. And if you're a judge, you can't be uh, a participant. So I didn't contribute to anything in NAID 95. Um, I judged all the demo competition and the music competition. Uh, fun fact, the music competition at NAID 95 was not over, uh, didn't have a lot of oversight. There was no judge pre-selection. So every entry was shown on the big screen and played. And nobody thought to add up the number of productions and how long they were when they made this decision. Uh, North America had a gigantic tracking scene in the 1990s. And so at NAID 95, the music competition lasted for six hours. And uh, myself and Snowman were the only two judges who actually stuck, or stuck around to judge all of the uh, music. So fun fact, judge pre-selection is a good thing, even if a lot of people who attend demo competitions hate it because the thing they worked so hard for got thrown out and they get mad when they hear that. But then when you see the stuff that didn't get thrown out, you're like, oh yeah, that was way better than what I did. So. Judge pre-selection, good thing. Um, in NAID 96, I decided to contribute something because I knew I was going back. And I worked with Fred of OTM, who provided the bulk of the 3D routines. And I did everything else, uh, the asset management conversion. Um, I, found, uh, uh, I found a musician, but unfortunately, he had to back out. And so we used a musician from OTM. And... Uh, got third place and I thought that was kind of fun. So hopefully uh, we will take these wonderful organizers' lead and have our own parties in our own provinces and states. And in 2004, uh, I decided to see what it would be like to challenge myself by, I started out on the 3D6 and higher, and I wanted to challenge myself and be like, well, what could I do lower than the 3D6? And I was originally targeted 2D6, and then I, uh, came across uh, an IBM PC that someone didn't need anymore. And when I got my hands on the original PC, uh, I thought, I wonder what can be done. And I don't, someone was joking around at work and they made the suggestion. It, it was something like, you know, that would be as dumb as, you know, showing full screen video on a IBM PC. And I couldn't let it go that entire day. I was like, well, wait a minute. I think that's possible. And how would I do it? And that became, 8088 corruption, which uh, contributed, which was uh, competed at Pilgrimage, which was a North American, small North American demo party in Utah, uh, and it won. And from that point on, I slowly got myself back into the scene, participating, getting familiar with parties, downloading productions. Um, and then just kind of every couple of years or, uh, you know, I would try to code up something else. And again, I would force myself on this lowest of the low platforms to see what was possible. Um, in 2014, I did 8088 Domination, which was a reworking of that video standard. Um, but prior to that, even, even almost two years prior, actually not even two years prior, I'd say even 10 years prior, through the internet and through sharing uh, like interests with other people, uh, like uh, Rhea Nigni, uh, real name Andrew Jenner, who is a coder, and Viler, uh, real first name Amir, who is an amazing graphics person. We had all just been communicating back and forth, showing each other uh, fun little things that we were doing with the original IBM PC. And in 2014, when I competed with 88 Domination and, and won again, um, <laughs> at a small uh, North American party um, called At Party. Uh, I think I got the idea that 
maybe we could produce something that would compete at, at a big party at Revision. Uh, and then Amir produced a technical effect with CGA and had graphics to illustrate it amazingly. And when I saw it, I was like, that's it. Like, we're going with that. If you've seen 88 miles per hour, the screen where it says 1K colors on it's on CGA when it's kind of, it's kind of like graffiti in front of a brick wall, that was what he showed me almost two years prior, and that's what really got it going. I was like, the world needs to see that, and so we just kind of built a demo kind of around that. I think the one thing it's it's fair even to say on this is that. This particular demo, 8088 MPH, but all of the other 8088 ones before it, um, they all used CGA. Now they used the, that was the original color graphics adapter of the IBM PC. And the thing about that particular adapter is it was very limited in many ways. And one of its limitations was that it had uh, an on screen palette of just four colors, right? And it had a palette of 16, and so you could make different color combinations, but you could only have four of those colors on screen at any one time. And in graphics mode, yes. In graphics mode, okay. And and that's that's important though, isn't it? In graphics mode. Yep. And, um, what you guys managed to pull off was not only to have um, over a thousand colors, I think it was, that's right. an incredible feat. But then if you go on top of that and you think about the speed at which the animation in that was drawn and the sprites that move around flawlessly and then the music that goes with it all at the same time, uh, the, the engineering that must have gone on to make such a piece of work happen is truly mind boggling. I mean, um, just the music alone, um, especially the music at the very end, um, it's all digitized music um throughout but importantly it's digitized music that comes on the pc speaker and PC yes speaker is just basically a little tweeter in a computer that has you know no channels of sound no digitized audio it's you know it has an oscillation and it's just a standard you know on off you can you can apply five volts or you cannot apply five volts and that is literally all you can do There are, there's almost nowhere to go if you've competed at Revision and won. Revision is kind of like the World Series of demo competitions. There are plenty, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of wonderful demo competitions all over. Uh, there's Syntax in Australia, which you may have attended or, or may want to attend. Um, there's tons of them all over the place and they're all fantastic but revision is consistently one of the largest and it has one of the it has the longest like the second or third longest heritage of being a good long pure demo party with really great releases and a lot of attendees when our group won revision 
2015's old school compo, I was kind of like, I'm done. Like, where else is there to go? So, and, and you know, we didn't know. We were kind of sitting back and hoping that other people would, would pick up the gauntlet and, and run with it. Um, so far, nobody has. So who knows? Maybe something will pull us back in and maybe we'll compete again with something else in a related area. But um, 2015 is kind of when I semi-retired, uh, you know, because 25 years in a scene, half your life in a scene, ending on a high note uh, seemed like the right thing to do. So, so about anybody in the know, it is, um, it is an intimidating task to come up with <laughs> Uh, particularly 808 MPH um, and I think worthwhile just um, stopping for a moment and appreciating just what feat it did. You know the very last line of that demo is uh, is uh, this is only the beginning of what of what we can do what can you do yeah. and I wrote that to try to get more people to make stuff and they didn't <laughs> and we also wrote it intention i mean when we wrote it we knew we were going to break emulators and so we thought oh this will make people improve their emulators and they didn't so uh so we i don't know how much i want to divulge so reenigni has written a cycle accurate 8088 emulator and it is in a core and it is in use in a couple of things so nobody picked up the mantle so we did and when it comes to 88 miles per hour, there may or may not be something to look forward to in the future. And that's all I'm going to uh, leave it at that. But keep watching the skies and uh, maybe there will be something cool to, to take a look at. I then went on to ask Jim about the nuances of coding an IBM PC demo. Specifically, I wanted to know all about how he coded and used pretty much one up from machine language, which is called assembler. Most old school demo coders will tell you that if you want to get the best results from the machine, you have to code as close to the machine as possible. Assembler is the option to do that. I've tried to get into assembler many a times and gone, it's too much for me because I'm just not mathematically minded. Believe it or not, neither am I. Um, it, it just comes down to, I am logically minded though. And so of course that, that helps. You don't necessarily need to be a, a math whiz. Um, maybe it helps. But um, to be honest, a lot of the techniques that are in 88 miles per hour are not really assembly tricks. Some of them are, but the great majority of them are just simply knowing your platform, which goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, we, we, knowing your platform in our case meant uh, performing a level of deep discovery that I don't think a coordinated group had done until we did. So exactly what the DRAM refresh tolerances are um, so that we could alter the timer speed so that when we did produce that music at the end, it didn't have some sort of oscillation or beating because we had two timer systems fighting with each other in the system, that kind of thing. Um, we could, I'm sure we could describe it without needing a, a, a master class in 8088 uh, assembly. So do you feel like the, the education and, the, and your trades being in mathematics, do you find that that really helps uh, when, you're, when you're using assembler uh, and, and writing effectively what, what are demos or, or, or parts of demos? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes and no. So there are demo effects where you definitely need mathematics. If you want to rotate an object on the screen, uh, you need to at least look up the mathematics that you need for that. That's not something that you can do without some sines and cosine functions. But there are also very many demo effects, which, you know, it's all been new to me. I'm still learning all of this stuff, uh, where the, the way the effect is done is really exploiting some kind of hardware feature of the machine. And uh, so there's an enormous variety within the demo scene of people who are just involved in the music, people who are just involved in the programming side, uh, some people are just involved in the graphics, uh, some people are artists, 
And uh, so, yeah, if you're just programming demo effects, uh, maybe half of what you do, you need some kind of mathematics, but it also usually is relatively um, elementary mathematics, unless of course you're doing something much more modern. On very modern machines, you have the time and you have the, uh, the horsepower uh, to, to do some really complex mathematical stuff. Uh, but on these older machines, if you know a little bit about sines and cosines and uh, just a very, very small amount about, um, you know, the counting numbers and, you know, how to do division and, and things like this, uh, then that's really enough. Again, a lot of the, you know, if you want to know one thing about the demo scene, it's the same thing I like to tell people about assembler programming and good assembler programming. And it's a quote from, I hope I'm saying this right, Terhi Matheson, uh, T-E-R-J-E is his first name, he's Finnish. And he has a quote, um, all programming can be viewed as an exercise in caching. And I agree with that uh, for the most part. When you come down to some of the very best demo coding, it's it's moving the most amount of data in the least amount of instructions possible, if that makes sense. Um, not wasting any cycle. I mean, you can draw a circle slowly or you can draw it fast. And the only difference between the two is that, you know, the slow one did lots of extra steps that wasn't necessary. And the fast one used exactly the steps necessary. So that's, that's pretty much it. That's more than half the stuff in 88 miles per hour, really. It's just um, being as efficient with what you're doing as possible. And yeah, that requires assembly, but the, the overall techniques themselves are universal. Make it sound so awesome. <laughs> it's not... uh, I've, I've always known how to program uh, since a very young age, but um, and I've actually known how to program efficiently since a young age. I've known how to deal with algorithms uh, maybe since shortly after university uh, but what I didn't know is all about how the demo scene uses hardware tricks and techniques so there's just a, an infinite amount of variety I mean down to finding instructions for the CPU that aren't documented or uh, finding you know secret hidden registers or whatever uh, you know there are a whole load of hardware features and tricks that you need to pick up. And some of these are secret because there's not demo scene production to based on them yet. And others are, you know, public and available. So it's a matter of just gathering the, the sources uh, that are out there, bringing them together and learning all of that stuff. So that's taken me years. And not only that, I mean, you, you don't get given a, a development kit when you start doing demo scene style programming. So you really have to start building up a repertoire of functions that you can call on. Uh, you know, ones that draw lines or circles or, you know, ones that scroll the screen or scroll text or, uh, you know, change the palettes, end times, or, you know, on the screen or whatever. Uh, so you have to build up a repertoire of tricks and techniques and and code that actually handles all of those things. You can code a demo in, in many languages and, and many have many, many people have so demos have been coded in C and C++. Um, and I don't know what portion of the amount of the, the demos that you've been involved in have been in um, C or anything else other than assembly. But obviously I know that um, a lot of the components that you've written are all in assembly. Um, assembler is not an easy thing regardless of what you may say. It's not an easy thing to get into, all right? How does one, did you have lots of friends that helped you out and learn? How, how did you manage to, to learn Assembler and know that you, you could go up against the others? Oh gosh. People learn Assembler coding demos because on some older platforms, they have to. The systems are too limited, they're too slow. The only way you're gonna get anything done is an assembler. The only way you're going to fit it in memory is, is via assembler. DOS was a little different. DOS systems always had 640K available for the most part, uh, at least when the demo scene was, when the DOS, when DOS systems had a demo scene. 
and sometimes much more than 640K. Uh, and the CPUs were also usually egregiously fast. So you could actually get away with writing an entire demo in C or Turbo Pascal, which is actually what I used to do some stuff in. In fact, it's what Future Crew used to make Second Reality. Second Reality has a lot of Turbo Pascal mixed in. It has some C mixed in. It has some assembler mixed in. You can verify this yourself by going to the uh, source code GitHub for um, Second Reality. It's up on GitHub. It was released open source, I want to say, about five or six years ago. Um, Turbo Pascal was a great environment for trying to learn assembler. It's, it's, I had known individual assembler snippets before 1991-ish in Turbo Assembler, um, but they were the types of things that you would type in either from a magazine or from, I'm ashamed to admit, well, I'm not ashamed to admit, a crack tutorial, how to crack this game, how to crack that game. And you'd load up debug and you'd type some arcane stuff and you'd look at it and some of the mnemonics would seem familiar like add like so i guess that adds numbers right or sub or ink or deck which increment and decrement mov which would move something although i you know when you're first starting out you think it actually moves it from a to b in fact it copies it from a to b why they didn't call it copy i don't know so you learn those little things and then later you get to, for me i got to an environment where i could try some of those same things make subtle changes, observe the differences, make more changes, observe the differences. Now my curiosity is peaked. I grab a list of all the op codes. I, um, and you know, and I started turning slow parts of my Turbo Pascal programs into faster parts by replacing the Pascal code with assembler code. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Most of my demo scene productions are prototyped effectively in Turbo Pascal. And then either portions of them are rewritten in assembler using the inline assembler. And uh, if it's small enough and doesn't require any complicated libraries like loading from disk or whatever, then I convert the whole thing to assembler. Um, and usually there's not much left to do because at that point, Turbo Pascal is essentially just a shell and a wrapper for the assembler. Um, but yeah, that's how I started. And having an IDE where you could write assembler, single step through it, and watch the changes with every line that you were stepping through was a fantastic learning tool. So that's what I used, and that's what I still use. Uh, my introduction to the demo scene uh, probably came, first of all, uh, in the very early, well, maybe 90s. Uh, so we bought a 286 computer. And uh, we had to go and have some software installed on it. I don't remember exactly what it was. And uh, the guy who actually sold us the hardware sent us to uh, this university student uh, to get the software installed. It was just kind of some kind of business relationship they had. And while we were there, we saw uh, an amazing amount of demo scene stuff uh, that he was showing off on his computer. Just happened to have it running in the background. And so that was the first time I actually uh, saw the demo scene. Uh, but then in uh, probably the mid 2000s, uh, there were a lot of uh, releases by Fibrash and they had uh, this amazing ability to compress, you know, full motion video and sound into 64 kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, but kilobytes. Um, and this just, enthralled me. I had to know how it was done and I had to uh, start programming it. They had this tool called uh, Werkzeug, which just means tool in German. And uh, so, uh, of course, I downloaded that and uh, may or may not have, uh, you know, reverse engineered portions of it and tried to start writing my own tool for doing this. It never really got very far, but uh, work and life got in the way. Uh, but that was my introduction. I spent a lot of time watching demos. Uh, around that time um, that was probably the uh, i had seen numerous demos before that point but that was the time when i really became most interested in the scene and um over the course of your exposure to the demo scene what uh, demo groups were your favorites oh well, that's a good question so now i'm gonna gonna be uh sometimes i get the demo scene groups and the 
the productions mixed up. But uh, yeah, certainly Farber Rush was my favorite by far. And then there was another one. I think the uh, demo group is Conspiracy. I always get the name of the production and the group mixed up. Now that was another one, but it's such a long time ago now, I'm actually having trouble remembering uh, the names. Uh, so more recently, obviously, I've gone back and explored some of the earlier demos, in particular, um, you know, Future Crew, uh, big favorites. And uh, then nowadays, um, a lot of the more recent stuff. So I was very, very inspired uh, in recent years by the 8088 MPH demo. Um, and that's, that's really been a source of a lot of the inspiration for my channel and uh, the programming that I've been doing myself. Uh, when you finally get an effect working, especially if you know that no one else has done this before, uh, or, or you have some idea of what other people have done before and you can compare it, uh, that is a really amazing feeling. Um, I don't think there's anything, at least, uh, you know, on, <laughs> on this side of eternity, I don't think there's anything that's comparable. That's all for this part of Back to the BBS. In the next episode, we discover the accompanying scene to the demo scene, the music tracker scene, where we get to meet some of the pioneers of early digital music for both demos and for the games industry. We meet with such names as Future Cruise musicians, Purple Motion and Skaven, as well as an Australian retro gig rocker Citrix, as well as popular games music composer Mark Knight otherwise known as TDK. That's all coming up in the next episode of Back to the BBS. If you've enjoyed this content, please consider supporting the work by donating on Patreon and liking this video and subscribing to the channel. Until next time, thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again soon on Back to the BBS.